Welcome, my name is Jan Libich and I'm really pleased to be joined by uh, Michael Knox, uh, the Chief Economist and Director Strategy of RBS uh, Morgans in Brisbane. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. It's always wonderful to see you, Jan. Michael, uh, today we're talking about financial markets and, and crises, and there's a lot of uh, material to talk about. But let's start with the, the difference between retail banking and investment banking. Um, could you please maybe summarize the issue for our students and um, uh, maybe uh, suggest whether these two types of banking should be somehow separated, as was the case until, 2000 and, uh, until 1999 uh, in the United States through the Glass-Steagall Act? Sure. Retail banking is uh, uh, the, the place you go to get the services that uh, you and I uh, use when we're uh, to help a shop. Um, it's uh, you go to the branch, you make deposits, you make withdrawals, uh, you get uh, mortgage loans for your house, uh, you uh, arrange a credit card, uh, you might make credit card payments. Um, all those sorts of things that uh, you need to uh, facilitate day-to-day -day life. Um, investment banks right. are really based on uh, the, the idea of the US wholesale market. Um, back in the 1930s, uh, the US decided to break up uh, branch banks. They had the brilliant idea that if one uh, bank in a branch failed and all the other branches failed so that they thought um, with uh, a towering level of intellect they thought that the problem which caused uh, financial banks must collapse as much be must be branch banking so they outlawed it and the result of that was that you needed a large capital market uh, in the US uh, for banks to trade bonds with each other for capital to get around the US and so what you then had was uh, banks uh, that specialised in the capital market and liquid and bond trading and, and there grew out of that a very deep uh, financial market in the US. And that became a multinational thing uh, with floating exchange rates because to have a floating exchange rate you need to be able to swap bonds between one country and another and to do that, you need a very deep capital market and you need investment banks uh, who can do that kind of stuff. So that generated investment banks and uh, the two of them work pretty well together. In Australia, we need to raise money uh, overseas in um, the wholesale investment banks to import it into Australia so that our retail banks can provide it uh, to the ordinary person. Uh, now in the US... Sorry. The, the separation in the US uh, uh, worked up until the 1999 uh, when, when the uh, Glass-Steagall Act was repelled. So what was the, the logic behind it? And, and, uh, and again, you know, is it something that we should uh, uh, blame the global financial crisis on? Uh, no, I don't think you should uh, blame the global financial crisis on. I think the global financial crisis problem came from a different area. Um, we had uh, uh, investment banks and retail banks working together okay in Australia and in the UK and in Canada, um, but in the United States, uh, the, in addition, to, uh, the, the, this whole separation was, all, was really about, uh, in the Glass-Steagall Act in the 1930s, was really about branch banking. Uh, not necessarily the difference between investment banking and um, and retail banking. Um, and when Glass-Steagall was repealed in the US, you had a process happening in the US which had really already happened uh, in British banks yeah. and already happened in uh, Canadian banks and South African banks and Australian banks. Um, what you had in addition though um, in the US uh, was, as these banks had been separated since the 1930s by Glass-Steagall, an entirely new institution grew up um, in the United States which was unique to the US environment uh, and that was uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, two government instrument 
instrumentalities which supported the wholesale mortgage market. We didn't need that uh, in Australia. We didn't need it in the UK because we had branch banking. But you needed it uh, in the US um, because of the absence of branch banking. And uh, those mortgage originators seem to be, over a period of 20 years or so, uh, extremely safe. And they were very uh, safe uh, originators of mortgages. And then, around about the end of the 1990s, uh, both sides of politics decided to distort, um, the, the, in the US case, the use of those mortgage originators by creating uh, subprime loans. And subprime loans were... So, so, so. If, if I could... Um uh, obviously, these have uh, these stock companies have uh, implicit government guarantees, and uh, and uh, they were set up to um, you know extend uh, this affordable housing idea, the idea that uh, it's it's a great thing that uh, as many people as possible own their house. So they uh, you know this is what they were set up for. Uh, now you mentioned that originally they were relatively saved. So how how did that change, uh, kind of in the lead up to the global financial crisis? Well, actually, in the 1930s, when uh, Fannie Mae was set up, which was the first one, um, it was a government instrumentality. Then in the 1960s, under the um, uh, Democratic ad administration of uh, Lyndon Johnson, he took. Uh, Fannie Mae off um, off balance sheet and it was in a way to try and reduce the apparent uh, accounting size of the US budget deficit. This was in the late 60s. Um, and what we then had in addition to that there was uh, Freddie Mac uh, uh, Fannie's little brother came along uh, in the 1970s I think and then there was other uh, um, other trading um, uh, intermediary called Ginny May uh, came along in addition to that. And it was only really between the 60s and the 70s that the actual government guarantee became an implicit guarantee. It's only in the 1990s, and then these functioned pretty well. And they functioned pretty well uh, in the early 80s when the savings and loans collapse uh, in the US. And it's the fact that they expand their market share during the period when the savings and loans collapsed, that people believe they're really rock solid. Uh, but in the late 1990s, it's only in the late 1990s that the Affordable Care Act, the Affordable, uh, sorry, the Affordable uh, Housing Act was passed through Congress. And this is the legislation which enables subprime loans. And, and then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were put under pressure uh, by uh, both sides of uh, the legislature to try and uh, you to advance these subprime loans. And the idea of subprime loans was that the housing price has been rising for 20 years in the, in the US. Um, and maybe we can use this uh, to generate a new form of mortgage, subprime, in which people who can't afford housing at the moment because they don't uh, have enough assets, uh, can get ex uh, immediate exposure to housing and then with the increasing price of the houses they own, they will then qualify for an ordinary mortgage. So they can, so they can use a subprime loan as an entry level product uh, into, uh, into housing and then they'll move over to an ordinary uh, uh, mortgage in a few years time when the house prices has gone up enough and they've got enough for what we would have as a uh, housing deposit. In Australia, we have a similar program with the uh, First Home Buyers Grant. It's a similar kind of idea. Mm -hmm. But subprime loans really work as long as uh, house prices continue to rise forever. Mm -hmm. And the problem was uh, that they didn't continue to rise forever. Right. So we had... We had all this, uh, all these teaser rates and all these no, uh, no proof of income, no down, down payment type of loans. But I think the numbers really document the, the rise in subprimes. Um, I think in the early 1990s, uh, there was uh, um, only about 
4%, 4 4.5% of the um, uh, U.S. mortgage market subprime, whereas just before the crisis 2006, we had uh, over 20% of subprime. And and in fact, over 80% of that was uh, securitized. So, um, and you, you mentioned the role in, uh, in securitization of, of Fannie and, and Freddie. But let's just uh, move on to the housing market, because many people uh, seem to uh, see this as a, as a trigger of, of that. Uh, you know, and uh, certainly in Australia, it's the case that people buy houses as an investment uh, property. And, you know, first year finance courses, we teach our students that um, the main thing about an investment is that it should be liquid. In other words, easily convertible into cash, which is certainly not the case for housing. So how did we get into a situation where people, you know, invest into housing, uh, uh, which, which doesn't seem to be like a very good idea? Uh, well, it's, it's kind of history. If you see houses prices haven't gone up for 20 years, you think uh, uh, they're going to continue to go up in future. But if you look at where house prices peaked, and I think it was in 2005, 2006 in the US, house price, the peak in house prices was about 240,000 US dollars, which is incredibly cheap in Australian terms, um, and then fell down to gee, about 160,000 US dollars last year, and now I think they're up to about 180,000 US dollars for a three-bedroom house now. So those prices are really, really low relative to Australian terms. So in Australian terms, you'd wonder how you could get the peak of a housing boom at 248,000 US dollars. And the problem is really, when you look at the data, it's not so much that there was a boom in house prices, but, but there was a boom in uh, housing finance uh, because um, what happened in addition to um, the subprime loan was a boom in securitization. And securitization, which, which you mentioned earlier, securitization gave people the illusion that if you mixed up a whole lot of different assets, mortgage-backed securities together with each other because of the risk or reduction in risk delivered through building a portfolio over holding one asset that you could rate these uh, securitized mortgage-backed securities of which there was a proportion subprime that you could rate these AAA and uh, Standard & Poor's actually went through a rating exercise um, with the securitized products of which a small proportion, a very small proportion uh, was subprime um, and they found that as long as housing prices didn't fall by more than 10% um, uh, therefore affecting the subprime section but not all the other sections uh, that it really uh, it had no effect on the value of the security and so they could rate those securities AAA. And the problem then was so the problem then was that banks began to include uh, these uh, mortgage-backed securities, these asset-backed securities, uh, as part of their Tier 1 capital within the US. And, and that was fine because they were tri AAA rated by Standard & Poor's, but it wasn't fine in terms of what happened later. Hmm. Now, in terms, I mean, this was not the, at the end of the, uh, uh, you know, financial magic because obviously uh, these uh, mortgage-backed securities were were further securitized, and you know, we had the the uh, collateralized debt obligations. So we had all these, you know, mezzanine and and CDO squared, and some of which, you know, the the top trenches of those uh, were still um, uh, rated as AAA. So this is, you know, it seems uh, this was one of the most amazing pieces of uh, in pieces of information in that, that has come out of the crisis that, that the, the regulators allowed, um, you know, this kind of uh, stuff to, to be happening. Ha has there been a failure in, in regulation, not imposing enough transparency in, you know, in labeling these financial products? What's your, what's your view on that? Well, I actually think there was a deliberate um, uh, failure of regulation. Um, and uh, the, there's a line that I love from Mark Twain uh, that in the United States there is no organized criminal class except the US Congress. Uh, and I think what actually happened was that both sides of the Congress uh, 
wanted this to happen because they wanted to gain more capital um, so they could get more uh, lower income voters with houses so they could get more votes from lower income voters. And that kind of deliberate distortion of the regulatory process, I think it was a political process in the United States, it notably did not occur in Canada. It notably did not occur in Australia, uh, where it might have done. And that's why I think, as the story went on, that's why I think you have a banking crisis in the United States uh, and a failure of those banks, whereas, and major banks becoming insolvent, whereas that does not happen in Canada and it does not happen in Australia because there is no distortion of our regulatory process the way it was done uh, in the US and the way it was done, for, and it was only a, a capable of being done in the US because it was, dis, it was supported by both sides of politics. Hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the common narrative of many people uh, blaming uh, bankers for the, for the financial crisis uh, is, uh, in your view, a uh, misrepresentation of the facts. Uh, would you, what's your, how would you well, defend the financial I think the, the US industry? Congress is unlikely to uh, blame, is, in, if the US Congress investigates these matters, it's likely to blame everybody except itself. Uh, but there are very good commentra uh, um, commentaries on the process and the best uh, is a book uh, by Raghu Rajan, uh, who was Chief Economist at the International Monetary Fund. Um, yeah. um, Fault in, Lines, I think. It's in 2005 and 2006, called Fault Lines, yes, uh, which provides a very good commentary um, on this. And uh, very interestingly, Raghu uh, spoke about this at a um, uh, uh, symposium for Jackson Hole, uh, at the Jackson Hole Symposium for the Federal Reserve um, in 2005 and forecast how uh, these asset-backed securities that were held as tier one capital um, by US banks would inevitably lead to crisis and in fact they did. Um, and when he did that, um, uh, Larry Summers, who was uh, uh, Treasury Secretary, said that uh, Raghu was a uh, roadblock on the way to financial progress. Um, and I don't think Raghu has ever forgiven him for saying it. So the, the other uh, uh, problem that many people have with the finance industry is is this uh, greed aspect. They they tend to believe that the you know the financial industry has uh, very short term incentives and they basically you know they they don't worry too much about the long term as well as they collect their bonus i always struggle with the, you know recognizing what what's the difference actually between greed and self interest which we all seem to have and that's uh, possibly a good thing but maybe you can throw some more light on 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 this uh. well People in financial markets, uh, uh, it's like uh, chief executive's uh, salary problem. Um, if uh, people object to chief executives being paid a lot of money, but if those chief executives weren't paid a lot of money, they would be company owners in their own right. They would be setting up their own individual companies and they would be making a lot of money from the activity in their own companies. Rather than those people being very successful operators of their own companies, large corporations pay those people a lot of money to gener generate those uh, kind of gains with scale for large corporations. So uh, uh, people get paid a lot of money. Well, in uh, financial markets, uh, you're moving a large amount of capital. Um, you have to move it very efficiently and very rapidly. Um, um, the, uh, the downside for people who make... Um, uh, losses in financial markets is enormous. They get fired. Um, uh, we've seen that kind of uh, effect in JP Morgan, the person who, the, uh, who was the head of risk in JP Morgan, uh, uh, who was an uh, extremely competent person with a long background, got fired uh, because uh, of a failure in uh, the British tr uh, bank trading section of, J of JP Morgan. So uh, the rewards are enormous. There are penalties for failure immediate, um, and so the returns are high. Michael, it, it, it can be argued that the, you know, the, uh, the downside risk being fired uh, nowhere near compensates the, 
you know the bonuses you collect uh you know when uh when you're on the on the on the lucky streak and and the problem is uh the limited liability you don't have to well first you don't have to give up back your bonuses that you accumulated in the past and second and that is the key is that the, the taxpayer is on the hook so it's not you know it's 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 not that the the financial broker has to pay pay out all the losses it's it's generally the the taxpayer um, uh, because the government steps in and bail, bails out these these financial companies um, and this is often referred to as the too big uh, to fail uh, problem can you so can you maybe uh, talk about this how can we uh, you know how can we reduce the the riskiness in the financial market and, and alleviate this uh, too, uh, too big to fail problem? Well, too big to fail is, uh, is yeah, I'll, I'll just continue on the previous thing very slightly. Um, financial mm -hmm. uh, market compensation is high when it's good. It's terrible when it's bad. Uh, um, you've seen uh, during the boom, people got paid a lot of money. Uh, but uh, over the last four years, a lot of people have lost their jobs. Really, the job losses in finance have been, have been dramatic uh, in the last four years. Uh, so we are seeing both sides of the both sides of the industry now. Now it's really, really tough, uh, and companies are going broke. Uh, people are being fired. Um, uh, so uh, we are seeing the downside of uh, um, television of uh, of uh, the finance industry. You know, I think of a kind of like the movie. A business, you know, it's a boom and bust business. People make a lot of money, mm. they get a lot of publicity, and they do very badly. But you don't see the people who are waiters being interviewed. You only see the people who are successful being interviewed. Um, so, so is it this? This this reminds me of the of the joke now uh, in the post uh, financial crisis era. What's the difference between a, an investment banker and a pizza? Um, well, a, a pizza can still feed a family of four. So, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, right, and maybe the right. investment banker is, is is carrying the pizza. Maybe that's what, maybe that's the reality of it. Um, <laughs> moving to the issue of too big to fail. Uh, it's obvious that uh, the amalgamation of banks led to a situation where uh, that proceeded to a point where some banks were beyond the span of management. Citicorp would be the best example. Um, and Citicorp became the largest banking organization in the world. And then in the financial crisis, Citicorp became insolvent. Uh, it only continued to exist because of funds from the troubled asset repair program. Um, and I'm not quite sure that they are out of the top yet. I think that they're still existing um, because of government finance. So clearly that, uh, that got too big. Um, uh, what is the and best solution you, I mean, to that? Sorry? Uh, I recently, well, not so recently, last year interviewed um, uh, Don Brash, the former governor of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, and um, he, uh, his suggestion was to um, basically explicitly acknowledge uh, which financial companies are too big to fail. And, and uh, because they are implicitly covered or even explicitly covered uh, by government guarantees, they have to actually pay. Uh, the f a fee they have to compensate everyone else for for this guarantee, and then all the other companies that are not too big to fail, they have to be you know the government has to commit uh, never bailing them out. What what do you think uh, uh, about this suggestion? Um, well, it's kind of the um, the original um, paradox in uh, in Lombard Street, you know, the classic book that was written about central banking in the nineteenth century. And that is that you have to tell bankers that you will never provide them liquidity. And then when a crisis happens immediately, you have to provide them with liquidity. Um, you've got that paradox in central banking. Uh, and uh, I don't I'm think right. that that suggestion is a way out of that paradox. I think uh, you'll still bail out those other banks uh, if the situation arises and, uh, and they need the liquidity. I think the solution is uh, the Teddy Roosevelt solution. Um, when Teddy Roosevelt uh, um, started, uh, or invented the antitrust legislation, and he broke up Standard Oil, and he broke up uh, um, 
the U.S. Steel companies at uh, the beginning of the 20th century. I think the important... Uh, that, in the U.S., I think there are 20 banks that have gone break this year, uh, but they've been reconstructed uh, and they haven't had any systemic effect because they're small. Clearly, banks got to a point where they were too big, uh, as steel companies did in the beginning of the 20th century, and I think that they need to be broken up and I, need to th I think that can be an effective part of legislation. Uh, we have effective banks in Australia which are much, much smaller than US banks, um, and that are smaller than British banks, but they operate effectively as international banks. Um, mm. There needs to be... A, a US banks need to be broken down to the level of uh, uh, near Australian banks, for example, and British banks the mm. same. So uh, mm. I think there is a lower operating uh, level at which you can reduce systemic risk and reduce bank size, and that, I think, is uh, what you get in return for supporting banks. I think you should support banks. You have to, uh, as part of central banking. Um, you can't say that you're not going to do it, but uh, you can't provide that support above a certain level. So I think uh, you should have trust busting and break up the banks, as was the case with steel mills and with oil companies at the beginning of the 20th century. Well, we, we saw uh, firsthand uh, in countries like Ireland and Iceland uh, what happens when banks grow too large. I mean, the, the losses of uh, banks in Iceland uh, greatly exceeded the, the GDP of, of, of Iceland as a country. So, you know, even if the policymakers wanted, there was simply no way to, to bail out uh, those institutions. So you're basically saying that this should have not been allowed to, to happen through more effective regulation. Now, let's, let's, let's talk about leverage, which is, uh, which is relevant to this, uh, this idea. Um, sh should leverage be somehow uh, regulated? I mean, we have Basel III, where, uh, where there are some capital requirements imposed on financial institutions. But what's, uh, what's your view on, on this? Has, you know, do we need to limit leverage uh, of financial companies in some way? Oh, sure. Or will the market sort out? Sure, of course we have to limit leverage. Um, I mean, if you're going to... I mean, but leverage has always been regulated um, within uh, banking regulations. It's just the level at which you decide that you should uh, regulate leverage. Uh, but the problem was that um, before the financial crisis, a lot of the assets that were owned by U.S. banks uh, were owned, um, and asset-backed securities that were owned by U.S. banks were actually parked off balance sheet. Uh, in structured investment vehicles where a lot of the asset-backed securities were owned. Uh, and when you looked at the formal balance sheet um, of the US banks, they were within the regulatory level and they had enough capital and they certainly had enough tier one capital. But, uh, and notionally, the structured investment vehicles, which were subsidiaries of the banks, uh, didn't affect the gearing ratios of the um, of the, of the parent company. Um, but uh, when uh, the structured investment vehicles collapsed and the losses had to be taken onto the uh, parent company balance sheets, uh, they operated as if they were a part of the balance sheet. But formally, they weren't. You know. um, so the regulatory structure uh, always um, regulated the level of re leverage that US banks could have. It's just that they were allowed to get around it by owning structured investment vehicles. And, and that's kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, was that a distortion? Was that lacklessness? Was that a misunderstanding of what structured investment vehicles was? I think there was a gross misunderstanding of asset-backed securities. People really did believe, and I remember reading speeches of Alan Greenspan, in which he really did believe that, that the portfolio effect of having different uh, asset-backed securities mixed together in a collateralised debt obligation really did reduce the risk and really, really did allow it to be uh, rated AAA. So I think it was, there was an innovation which was not understood at the time, which had vastly more risk because of its complexity than people understood at the time. And the complexity shielded uh, the, the understanding of the true level of risk that those asset-backed securities contained. 
Now, there's, I think the theoretical underpinnings of, of all this uh, securitization came uh, from a, an article by a guy I think called Michael Lee who came up with this Gaussian popular uh, function. And he himself was pretty uh, clear about the shortcomings of this approach of coming up with one single number that summarizes, you know, very complex, complex risks. But unfortunately, uh, many of the finance um, uh, people have not really listened and kind of embraced it as a as a as a mantra, but let's let's move on to the um, onto the asset markets, onto the stock market. We we obviously post uh, Lehman Brothers collapse, we saw a, a big uh, nosedive uh, in in, in um, stock prices. But uh, in the United States, the uh, the market started recovering in about March two thousand and nine, and basically now uh, fully recovered. And and what worries me is that you know when you look at the fundamentals in terms of the world economy and the U.S. economy, the, all the long-term problems of aging population, fiscal sustainability, we will hopefully touch on some of those a bit later. Uh, it doesn't seem that, that this growth um, is, is justified. And, and there are people who, who argue that this could be the next bubble. That basically the, and and the, the related issue is that, you know, uh, the, the banks, why did it turn? The banks that used the bailout money were the only subjects uh, in the you know, early 2009 who actually had any money. So they, they actually made a killing by using taxpayers' money and buying at the bottom of the market, which, you know, which means that they, they had record profits in, in 2010. Uh, and, and many people find it unfair that they were using taxpayers' money in such way and didn't have to pay back uh, a lot of the bailout money. What, what's your view on, on the long-term kind of outlook for the U.S. stock market and, and this kind of issue of, of unfair, un, unfair usage of taxpayers' money at the, at the trough of the market? Well, I think that's a really great conspiracy theory and it's supported by everything except the facts. <laughs> um, the reason that um, the U.S. stock market has recovered uh, since uh, 2008 has absolutely nothing to do uh, with the banks. Um, uh, bank earnings are still, uh, well, they were up until a year ago, still very miserable, I have to say. And the housing sector was com still completely shot up up until about a year ago. And since then, you've seen uh, some recovery. That's only this year. This is, you know, this is 2012. You've seen some recovery in bank earnings. And this is the first recovery we've seen in all of that time since uh, um, um, since the financial crisis. And the reason for that is that uh, the stock of unsold houses has fallen down to a level where the inventory of unsold houses for the first time in five years is less than uh, six months of inventory. And for, for the result of that is that house prices have stopped falling in the US. And the result of that is that mortgage lending has started to rise and the result of that is that banks have started to make more money. But only now and after five years. So why has the stock market gone up? The stock market has gone up because the US is a very dynamic economy and whole other industries have boomed which have nothing to do with banking and nothing to do with housing. We've had a boom in two major industries. Technology and energy since 2005 in the United States. Now we all know about the technology boom. Boom. Uh, iPhone, iPad, I'm here. Uh, we've seen an enormous boom uh, in technology investment. Technology investment in real terms, uh, year by year, has been increasing for the last four years as rapidly as it was in the tech boom of the 1990s. Uh, but we've had a different side of technology boom. We've had a consumer technology boom. Um, whereas uh, in those days, people were building the internet, now they're using the internet. So there's been an enormous increase in um, the booms of technology companies and Apple is the most profitable company in the United States. That wasn't true. That wasn't true uh, in 2006. In addition to that, you've had a whole revolution in the production of energy in the United States since 2007. And that has been through shale gas. Uh, the price of shale ga of gas relative to gasoline in the United States is one sixth of what it was in 2002 because of the enormous increase in the production of gas. 
So you've had this shale gas boom, which has generated enormous profits for energy companies, and you've had this technology investment boom, which has generated uh, enormous booms for technology companies. And right now, uh, we think that the stock market is about 200 points too cheap. Fair value based, the earnings are the highest in history. Earnings are now higher than they were in 2007. Uh, banks haven't recovered much. Uh, housing hasn't recovered much, but there's enormous boom in technology earnings and energy earnings, and we think that stock market should be in the US should be 200 points higher than it currently is. Currently trading at about 1400, I fair value it at 1660. It should be much much higher, and that's because you've got a broadly based dynamic US economy that has a lot more doing than just building houses and lending money to people to do it. Now, uh, people like Paul Krugman would uh, point to the employment, poor employment record. I mean, unemployment rate is still above 8%. Uh, so we've seen very little recovery on the employment front. Uh, so so the, the picture uh, is kind of a little bit more pessimistic than, than if you just look at the GDP numbers. But let's move on from the, the causes of the crisis onto uh, policy responses. And... Um, uh, basically, most central banks have reduced uh, uh, rates to uh, very low levels, uh, the Fed um, in late 2008 to, to virtually zero. And, um, um, you know, the effectiveness of those steps uh, is, is arguable. Uh, there is some evidence uh, for and some, some against it. But last week I interviewed uh, Warwick McKibben, who was, the, as you know, the former uh, member of the board of the Reserve Bank of Australia. And his view is, and, and that, was, that goes back to the uh, time he was on the board up until last year, uh, that once you reduce rates uh, below about 3% in nominal terms, you, you're really misallocating capital. So having, having his view is that having rates at zero for such a long period of time, a few years, may, may lead to really serious misallocations of capital and, and uh, you know, various imbalances in the future. Uh, um, are you worried about those things, or is it? Do you think it's overstated? Um, well, I think there's a whole lot of topics in what you've just said, but I'll just cut to the chase. Uh, I find there's a very a strong empirical relationship between the real Fed funds rate and U.S. Uh, employment growth uh, two and a half years later. Uh, and if you want to maximise year-on-year growth in payroll employment in the U.S. Uh, what you've got to do is you've got to reduce the real Fed funds rate. The only way you can reduce the real Fed funds rate when it's already zero is by increasing inflation, and the only way you can do that is by increasing the money base, i.e. print money. So my view is that the Federal Reserve, if it wants to generate higher employment growth, it needs to be maintaining um, a higher level of inflation than 1.8% or 9% 1.9% in terms of core inflation, which is where it currently is, it needs to be maintaining a target inflation rate between 3 and 4%. If it does that, we can have uh, higher employment growth and we can have full employment. But I think that's what's happening. Uh, but the reason that you wind up uh, with these very low real interest rates um, uh, what to, we, we could be understood if we could summon up the ghost of Hyman Minsky. Yeah, Minsky is the guy who invented the word credit crunch which is, of course, what we went through uh, in, uh, in 2007, 2008, 2009. And he talked about that's what happens when you let your debt to GDP get to very, very high levels, so that it can't be supported by the level of income. And what that means is you have to have, it can only be supported at very, very low levels of interest rate. So either you, you uh, have extremely low interest rates and you, and low levels of real interest rates, or you find that this enormous level of debt to GDP uh, crushes the economy into deflation. So what do you want? Do you want to have deflation uh, generating a 1930s scenario, or do you want to have a higher employment growth allowing us to grow out of it? I don't think providing resources to generate employment growth is a, is a misallocation of resources. So I may disagree. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And, and again, there are some voices advocating uh, uh, temporarily increases in, in inflation in the United States, and that would help 
uh, as you're suggesting, that would also help not only on the employment front and, and as a recovery, but uh, also to, to reduce the, the real uh, uh, debt burden um, of the United States and other countries. But, uh, you know, that, that seems like a short-term fix. From a longer-term perspective, what you want is, uh, is that government debt doesn't reach high levels in the first place um, so that you don't have to then step in and, and, and uh, uh, monetize that debt. So, so moving on to fiscal policy responses, we've seen a lot of uh, fiscal um, uh, stimuli in, in, uh, in response to the global financial crisis. And uh, again, the views differ. Some people argue that uh, we haven't had enough. Uh, some people argue that we've had too much. Uh, certainly for Australia, th these voices are more prevalent. So what's, what's your view on the fiscal side of the responses to the global financial crisis? Um, so... Uh, just so I understand your question, are you saying that the deficit should have been bigger in Australia or that we're creating too much debt in Australia? Which, uh, so I understand the question because the way you phrase that question in Australia is different than the way you might phrase that question in the United States or the way you might phrase it in Greece, for example. So, so, so tell me well, again what you're issues, these, these issues are obviously related whenever you... Uh, uh, you use fiscal expansion to to stimulate the economy. You're creating uh, a debt burden. Um, so uh, the issue is whether you know your fiscal long-term fiscal situation is 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 fine so that you can actually afford, uh, afford it, uh, which seems to be the case of Australia. Uh, whereas uh, in in Europe and in the United States, that's not that's not why the case. But but you know. So let me break it up. The first question was: Have these fiscal uh, you know stimulus packages been successful in in maybe averting a, a major um, uh, disaster, or have they have they not really um, played an important role um, in in countries like the U.S. In countries like the U.S. Um, um, the best individual study I've read of what happened in the U.S. was the one by um, uh, Mark Zandi and um, and Blinder, so Zandi and Blinder on um, what uh, the the recovery from the U.S. economy, and they looked at two effects. One was uh, uh, House of Representatives Bill Number One, which was the um, uh, Obama, I guess, Recovery Act, which I think was uh, $980 billion, was from, from recollection. And uh, the TARP, uh, the Troubled Asset Repair Program, which recapitalized uh, the banks, which uh, my recollection was $780 billion. And they found that, uh, the recapitali that recapitalizing the banks um, and other industries was five times as effective, five times the money multiple, uh, the fiscal multiplier as old-fashioned public spending, and old-fashioned pub public spending had a uh, fiscal multiplier below one um, and was pretty ineffective. That is to say, you got more debt than you got addition to GDP, so why do it? Uh, but recapitalising the banks was extremely effective. So I think uh, that uh, what I learned from reading uh, Blinder and Zandi uh, was that if you want to do fiscal stimulus, what you should do is an entirely new form that wasn't done in the 1930s. What you should be doing probably is uh, taking uh, preference shares of your companies. So that in Australia, instead of um, um, uh, building schools um, or uh, putting um, um, uh, defective insulation in our ceilings, uh, what we should have been doing is uh, buying preference shares in Australian companies at the bottom of the stock market when the stock market was uh, uh, you know 50% uh, lower than it currently is and that would have been a much better investment firstly in terms of generating employment in Australia and activity in Australia uh, and secondly as a, as a return on taxpayers money um, because uh, the problem about old-fashioned fiscal stimulus is that it worked really well when we all lived in closed economies and the money went round and round and you had high fiscal multipliers. But now we live in very open economies and many fiscal multipliers for European countries are at 0.3 or 0.4. So uh, for every dollar they spent, they get 0.3 or 0.4 of a dollar or 0.4 of a euro increase in output. And in Australia, even when we did the fiscal stimulus, uh, 
we were going to get uh, 0.7 of a dollar in response for the dollars we spent. So uh, I think if you're having to spend back, pay back a dollar and only going to get 70 cents of, of add to GDP, you're much better off not spending the dollar. Um, mm. well, at the bottom of uh, the GFC, uh, the RBA was, still had a, uh, a short rate of 3%. We could have had a much better effect on the Australian economy by cutting interest rates down to zero the way it was done by the Federal Reserve than by spending what turned out to be 200 billion Australian dollars addition to national debt uh, to get a stimulus. Because all we got in Australia was a situation by spending that money where we see that, saw that the RBA had to turn around and tighten monetary policy uh, to almost 5%, which actually turned out to be generate a long-term uh, growth recession in the Australian economy uh, where retailing uh, had to be stood on, where house building had to be stood on, and everybody except the mining industry had to be stood on uh, because inflation was too high because we had this, we'd gone through this period of fiscal stimulus. So it seems to me that the cost we had to pay for the fiscal stimulus in Australia was much greater than the benefit that we received. Hmm. Now, in terms of the, um, uh, the size of the fiscal multipliers, there was a recent controversy in terms of the ID, uh, IMF, which openly um, conceded that in their previous projections, they were using a multiplier, a fiscal multiplier of, of 0.5. And it turns out that the latest numbers uh, show that in, you know, in, a, in, a, in an aftermath of a major crisis, um, such as now, uh, the, uh, the, the multiplier uh, is much higher uh, between 1 and 1.7, which, which means that obviously a fiscal stimulus would be more effective and uh, vice versa. It means that austerity is a lot more damaging, uh, you know, in the short term to the economy than, than most people that were designing these uh, uh, policies um, had anticipated. But let me, uh, one interesting issue well, yeah, you, should send um, you me mentioned a copy was of that, that because I, I think, like I say, with like Blaine, Blinder and Zandi, uh, I think some parts of the fiscal stimulus might be amazingly effective and some parts of the traditional uh, fiscal stimulus done in the, in the good ideological way of the 1930s still have very low fiscal multipliers. Mm, okay. Now, uh, you also mentioned, you touched on the issue of, you know, the, the, the central bank having to somehow uh, respond to, uh, to what the government's doing, which monetary and fiscal policy uh, going on. And as you know, that's uh, one of my main research areas. In, in fact, you've been uh, very kind and, and cited uh, a lot of my research uh, uh, in this. So can you kind of explain what this interaction is about? Uh, um, you know, how is it that the central bank, even if independent, is somehow connected to, to what the government is doing and, and, and the other way around? Um, well, what I, um, uh, what I did was earlier this year, in, uh, after the federal budget, uh, I gave a speech on the same platform as uh, the Australian Federal Treasurer, uh, Wayne Swan. And I quoted uh, a previous article of yours in terms of the interaction between central bankers, a national central banker and a national treasurer. Um, and I, I looked at uh, not, the, um, uh, not Wayne Swan's forecast of where the budget deficit was going. I went to the IMF view of where the budget deficit was going. Uh, and I said uh, that I didn't think uh, that the budget would actually be balanced in the foreseeable future. And I was really surprised that Ryan Swan didn't take offence to that. But I did say that the IMF thought there would be an enormous fiscal contraction. And I thought that uh, the RBA might respond to that on the other side by cutting interest rates. Uh, and Wayne Swan was enormously taken by that view and said that he might show my, uh, my speech to the, to the Governor of the Reserve Bank. So obviously he was playing the game that you... Uh, you theoretically invented Jan, so I was very, uh, I was very happy to see that a theoretical game could actually be played out in practice. And but I do think, uh, and I've said on television interviews, uh, that I think that uh, what is happening is in practice that uh, the RBA is reacting to the fiscal tightening in Australia by cutting interest rates, and uh, the government sees that very much in its advantage because. Cutting interest rates generates uh, lower uh, housing loan interest rates. And as that is happening, the government standing is rising in the polls 
So there may be an additional feedback loop uh, in the game yarn which you could include in a further article uh, that by uh, playing this game uh, of uh, responding to uh, that, that, that the, uh, the Treasury is not just responding to a threat from the central bank of what interest what he might the central bank might do with interest rates he's responding to his own view of what he can get the central banker to do and what that will then do uh, to uh, the Treasurer's political support and I think that's very much what's happening now I think uh, uh, the, the government is hoping that its fiscal tightening will reduce interest rates, reduce housing on interest rates and is increasing its political popularity. Michael, you'll be pleased to know that uh, this is actually already incorporated and uh, based on the theoretical analysis in, in this game of chicken, the government's behaving as a Stuckelberg leader. And if you are the leader, uh, you, you have uh, a lot more leverage over the other institutions. So the, the government, by moving first, it can force the RBA to just respond uh, in, in the way that they want, which is cutting cutting interest rates. But, but uh, look, yeah, moving, yeah, moving I will to the... Yeah, I will be able to quote you on the whole concept of Stuckelberging chickens. <laughs> I, I would like to move on to the, the future outlook. Um, given um, the developments of the last few years, um, we seem to be uh, facing some challenges uh, in terms of the world economy. And, and they're obviously bigger in some countries than others. Australia is uh, uh, in a relatively good um, position. But if, if we look at the, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, in the United States, its balance sheet have uh, basically tripled uh, since uh, late 2007. And, you know, this is unprecedented. Uh, and many people obviously um, uh, see a threat of, of future inflation uh, down the track. Uh, do you think it's justified? Um... Well, it's a, it's a really good question because we've seen an even bigger expansion in the European Central Bank balance sheet that we have in the Federal Reserve balance sheet. And the fear uh, that Germans have is that that's going to generate a lot of inflation. And the fear uh, in the US that the libertarians have, uh, the Tea Party uh, people within the Republican Party fear that that's going to generate a lot of inflation. But I think what we've seen is we've seen something break down, and that is uh, the, uh, the money multiplier. Time was when uh, if you increase the money base, uh, then banks would lend more money and that would increase the money supply and that would drive, down, drive up inflation. But we've had uh, in this financial uh, crisis a complete breakdown of money multiplier. And so banks are not lending mo more money and so there is no more inflation. Um, now sometime out there in the future we are going to see banks lending money again and the money multiplier working again. And I'm guessing that around about that time uh, the Federal Reserve is going to reverse what it's doing in its balance sheet and Mario Draghi is going to do the same thing in, uh, um, in the ECB. But yeah, it ain't happened yet and I don't think it's going to happen next week. Um, and when you see it happening and, or when I see it happening, I think we'll tell each other but uh, uh, you've got to see that, in, what you've got at the moment is you've got an increase in the money base both in Europe and the United States, and you've got an almost negligible uh, increase in the money supply in comparison because you've seen this enormous decline in the money multiplier. And I just think we don't understand the money multiplier enough. It was a single number back in all that Keynesian math uh, that I learned in graduate school, and it ain't so. It doesn't work that way. It's much more complicated. How it works, I don't know yet, but I'd like to. And now the, uh, the Fed has, in fact, uh, what, what's called an exit strategy along the lines you, you indicated. And they have an extra instrument. In, in late 2008, they were authorized by the Congress to, uh, to pay interest on these excess reserves that commercial banks uh, you know, hold at the Fed, which, is, you know, which accounts for the majority of the, uh, you know, of the increase in, in the monetary base. And uh, so Bernanke is basically planning to... S as uh, the, the, the economy recovers and the banks are more tempted to take the money and, and use them in the real economy, uh, Bernanke just wants to keep increasing that interest and, and, and such make it 
uh, make it still attractive for the banks not to not to throw the money in the real economy and in such way to slowly suck out this excess liquidity. Now, uh, you know, it's never been tried before. So the question is whether that whether he'll be able to uh, to pull it off. But let's let's look at the uh, the, the fiscal side. Uh, we, we talked about uh, some of the major challenges. One of them, uh, to my view, is the aging population and the fiscal sustainability uh, a problem. Now, um, and, and, you know, these, these things usually in the past that were solved uh, or, or certainly can be solved through monetary means, just creating, creating a lot of inflation and, 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 and uh, uh, debasing the, the currency. But, but if you look at long term U.S. and Japanese debt, 10, 30 year uh, bonds, they have extremely uh, low returns. So people, people on the care of the Keynesian persuasion, they, they point to that and say, well, look, there's no inflation on the horizon. Inflation expectations, uh, you know, don't, don't seem to worry. On the other hand, there are people like Leaper who say, well, you know, that doesn't mean anything. It's just the, the low yields are because of the flight to safety uh, to those, you know, U.S. and Japanese assets. But, you know, that could quickly change. So what's your view on this, uh, on, on long-term yields and long-term uh, future long-term inflation and, and long-term fiscal sustainability? Well, I think this uh, uh, paper's been done by Chen Rogoff in both Reinhardt's, both uh, Carmel and uh, uh, her husband, who's the chief economist of Morgan Stanley. And the more interesting uh, of those was uh, done by Ken Rogoff and, and uh, uh, Mr. Reinhardt or Dr. Reinhardt. Well, they're both Dr. Reinhardt's, I guess, so, you know, but how do you describe it? But what it really shows is that um, once countries get uh, their debt to GDP ratio, the net debt to GDP ratio over 90%, then there is uh, a rapidly increasing uh, probability of some kind of fiscal crisis. Uh, now, you see that Japan is way above that and hasn't had a fiscal crisis yet. But that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. But certainly in uh, the UK and the US case, whenever they've had debt to GDP ratios over 90%, uh, they tend to have uh, a, a, an increasing probability of some kind of either currency crisis or um, an interest rate. A bond, it's either a bond market collapse or a currency collapse. That's what's happened when you get high debt to GDP ratios in the UK or the US. So even though interest rates may be low and, and interest rates are low because inflation is low, it doesn't mean that uh, countries which are credited countries like the US and the UK can't be in a situation of having big collapses in their bond market uh, when their debt to GDP ratio gets too high. And if we look at the IMF mm -hmm. forecasts for US net debt to GDP ratio, it should be, uh, within five years, it should be uh, about 90% of GDP, uh, net debt to GDP, uh, which is the same as Ireland has. So I say, I say that uh, people in the US Congress either have to do something about the deficit or they have to learn a lot of good Irish jokes between now and then. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, you, you mentioned the Rogo and Reinhardt story, and I... I I, I like the analysis. I just have to say that the 90% debt to GDP ratio is very arbitrary. They basically, when they do the econometrics, they just, you know, kind of put brackets uh, and, and, you know, arbitrarily pick the 90%. It could be as well, you know, it could be 70 or 80 or 100. So that's this, sure. this you know, this 90% doesn't really come out of the analysis as such. There was an assumption that they made. But, but uh, going back to debt to GDP ratio, it doesn't seem to be uh, showing the full picture in terms of a country's fiscal system. Sustainability. I mean, Larry Kotlikov has been very instrumental in in arguing for this intergenerational accounting that we have to look at the size of the fiscal gap, which is just the the difference between you know the the net present value of all the expected um, expenditures based on current policies minus the net present value of the, of the taxes. And, and in the United States, this has been um, estimated by Kotlikov as well as IMF people and so on in the order of, you know, $230 trillion. So that's, that's more than 10 times the official debt to GDP um, uh, figure. And, and we see in, in, in Europe, countries like Spain have a, have a lower debt to GDP ratio than, you know, than France. And they seem to um, have a, uh, they seem to be facing a, a, 
a debt crisis, whereas uh, France is not. So it seems like the future is very important and it's not reflected in the official numbers. And I think what, there's also what, what a demographic your, thing that happens to you. Um, I think that if you look at, for example, um, the Japanese economy, where the population is much older, older people tend to save more and therefore you can support higher levels of debt to GDP ratio. In the Spanish economy, the... Um, Popular and, and what we you actually see in Japan is the population is actually falling. Um, the population growth rate is less is less than one. Uh, yeah, well, it's less than less than zero. Whereas in Spain, you've got a higher population growth. The the average population uh, is much much younger than in um, uh, than in uh, Japan, and so their savings rate tends to be lower. Uh, so to me, it does a major demographic effect too on whether, uh, as well as net debt to GDP ratio as to whether a country is going to fall into crisis. And I think that therefore, if you look at countries like Australia in particular, Australia has, since uh, the 1950s anyway, we've tended to run balanced budgets, apart from a particular period in the 1980s, we've tended to run balanced budgets and we've tended to have relatively low GDP. But that's to me, is a counterpart in Australia, but our very high population growth in Australia. And that's because of um, that high population growth um, is because of our high immigration. But I understand we're now, mm. sadly, running out of time for this interview, Jan, although it, we would have liked to have yeah, gone on for much I, longer. <laughs> I'll have to continue it over lunch sometime. If you need to go and, and uh, you know engage in various financial activities, uh, I, I would let you go. If you had uh, one minute for a very quick summary of the main lessons that we've learned from the crisis, just uh, you know okay. a few sentences. What would the what? Oh, um, um, I, I did say. In terms uh, of regulation. Yeah, I, I did say uh, that that um, uh, when you were talking about Basel before. Um, mm. uh, I I did say in a uh, in a forum at a conference that we were both at uh, a couple of years ago, but I think the dazzle is faulty. Um, I think mm. the uh, ability to uh, generate a single set of rules for all banks is uh, is a lot harder than it seems to be. I think that uh, the financial crisis, Raghu Rajan. Uh, when I asked him that question, when, uh, I asked him the question, um, he was on a uh, platform with uh, Paul Krugman, and I asked, the, asked him the question, what was the signal that you knew uh, that the financial crisis was going to happen? And he said it was when asset-backed securities were engaged, included in T1 Capital that uh, the financial crisis became inevitable. I think that's what I would learn. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, uh, but what we see that uh, in Europe that it wasn't uh, the inclusion of asset-backed securities in Tier 1 capital, it was the reverse. It was the con uh, inclusion of sovereign debt in Tier 1 capital uh, that caused the, bank the banking panic in Europe. So, so, what, so what, how did we get here? Well, we got to uh, the US banking crisis um, on the road to good intentions by trying to get poor people houses that they couldn't afford. Mm -hmm. And that's how that came about. Um, and uh, in Europe, uh, it was the inclusion of poorer countries than should have been in the Euro, for example, Greece, um, uh, to include their well-being as well. So it was a, another set of good intentions. Uh, so perhaps in terms of banking regulation, we should always be aware of good intentions, yeah. Lovely. That's that's a great um, uh, kind of last uh, uh, remark, um, Michael Knox. Thank you very much for joining us and for sharing your insight and expertise uh, with myself and the global audience. Uh, and we wish you all the best for um, in the future. Thank you again. Thank you, Ian. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks.